Okay, we are live. Welcome to the show, everyone. I have a really exciting segment today. Absolutely delighted to have the one and only George Selgin joining me to discuss what's going on in El Salvador at the moment. They recently passed a Bitcoin legislation, and so we're going to dive into that. But welcome to the show, George. Oh, thank you, Naomi. It's a pleasure. It's been a, it's been a while. I haven't seen you for many, 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 many years. True. That's true. Well, I kind of blame you for that. I blame me too, yeah. <laughs> to give people some background on who George is. So George was actually, uh, well, as, as well as being a, an expert in free money and, uh, and all of that, was actually an economics mentor of mine as well and kind of got me onto the free money bandwagon many, many years ago. I have his book on my shelf over there called Good Money and uh, sort of dives into why the private sector was able to pick up the slack where the government, um, you know, didn't didn't do a good job in terms of money and sort of talking about like uh, private alternatives. And so he's been diving into the, the Bitcoin world has, uh, I mean, you're, you're interesting in this space because you you have such a prestigious position in terms of, you know, economics and, um, and free money and all of that. And uh, so you treat Bitcoin very seriously, but you also are not afraid to be critical and call out the areas that it lacks. So talk to me a little bit about your background in, in all of this. Well, goodness, I, you know, I, I've been at this a long time, as you suggested, Naomi. I, uh, I got into economics mainly uh, owing to my interest in free choice and currency. I, I was already, an, I had an undergrad degree. I was at grad school studying, but my interest was actually marine biology with some <laughs> economics mixed in. And, oh, I did uh, not know that. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I wanted to work on the Calypso and go down in the Sukup and all that. But, um, but uh, I got distracted by the inflation that was raging. This is around 1980. And I uh, got more and more interested in monetary economics, read a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, one of the things I ended up reading was Hayek's little pamphlet on choice and currency, which I happened to uh, tweet about uh, today. Uh, and that really got me excited. Uh, and I thought, wow, this is a different way of looking at things. And I did a summer research project uh, funded by uh, IHS. When I say funded, I mean, it was 1500 bucks, but that was big money for me back then. And uh, I, I explored what it would have, what, what bearing government intervention had on US monetary history. Did it really make things worse or what? And I came out of that research absolutely convinced that, uh, that the government's interference with money was the main cause of most of uh, the United States historical problems with its monetary system. Of course, by then I was entirely hooked and I went on to uh, study with Larry White at NYU, whose research I found out about that summer. I wrote to him, I said, uh, Professor White, when you get a job, he was still a graduate student when I wrote to him. I said, uh, when you get a job, <laughs> you let me know where, because I'm going to come and be your first student. And that's what happened at NYU. And I've been more or less devoting my research to this general topic of choice and currency and private monies ever since. For sure. The Hayekian idea of competing currencies is really what, what drove me into Bitcoin. I was really into Austrian economics at the time. And I'm like, oh, you know, this is really exciting. We have this alternative, this free choice, as it, as it were. Now, we're not going to dive into Bitcoin specifically, um, but let's dive into El Salvador mm -hmm. and what's going on there. Because on the one hand, it seems like it's a huge win for Bitcoin. It seems like, wow, you know, we had this grassroots free money rise up. Um, and now governments are accepting it as legal tender. That seems huge. That seems exciting. But you brought up some great points in a tweet uh, in a Twitter thread earlier today where you're talking about specific actual clauses in uh, the legislation that was passed. And it was uh, it was passed today, uh, this morning, I believe. And um, and they quite problematic and seem to be actually the antithesis of freedom in money. So let's first of all, um, for anyone who doesn't quite understand what's going on in El Salvador, can you give us an overview of the law and why people are excited about this, what this could mean for the country? Well, sure. Well, uh, the law is a very short law. It's three pages or two pages, actually, uh, in the versions that are mostly going around. And uh, it's got something like 15 or 16 articles in it most of which really do provide for uh, uh, what uh, to, 
to repeat uh, the old cliche, provide for a more level playing field, particularly between Bitcoin and the US dollar. And all of those provisions are, are actually very, very good provisions. So the, the mm -hmm. law is 75, 80% uh, super for Bitcoin mm -hmm. and, and for, for El Salvador and for the general cause of choice and currency. Yeah, and before uh, we dive into the um, the reservations you have about yes, it, um, let's give a little yeah. bit about there are, background about El Salvador, because they've been on the US dollar as their currency standard since I think 2001. Officially since 2001, but they were largely unofficially dollarized even before that. And that happened, uh, of course, originally spontaneously as a result of El Salvador's abuse of its own independent mm -hmm. currency in the 80s. It had very high inflation, often 30%, even more annually. So that was not good. And the dollarization was good uh, there, as it has been in many, uh, in several other countries. It's been a very good thing. But allowing people to use Bitcoin and making sure they're not penalized for using it is, is another good thing. So this is all great. Mm -hmm. However, well, before it gets yeah. to be, we're going to get to the however. Okay. I want to dive okay. more into the, the good side of this. Um, mm. So there are some other um, things that come along with this. There are no penalties, as you said, for using Bitcoin there. How does this compare to other countries? Because it seems that in the US, you use it, it's considered property, so you get capital that's gains. Right. You don't have any of that in El Salvador, right? Uh, that's correct. Now, um, my understanding is that El Salvador doesn't tax individuals' uh, mm -hmm. uh, capital gains. So as far as they're concerned, uh, there was no problem before. However, okay. for businesses, there is a corporate capital gains tax. It's, uh, corp I think their taxed capital gains are taxed as ordinary income up to something like Oh, goodness, I'm going to get in trouble putting out a number, up to some number. <laughs> up to some nondescript number. Beyond that amount, I think it's 10, 10%. I may be wrong. Anyway, so that, that affects merchants accepting Bitcoin because they have mm -hmm. to keep tabs, just as, as they do here in the United States for Bitcoin transactions. And this new law gets rid of that. And mm -hmm. to that extent, and in other ways, the law makes it easier for people to trade with Bitcoin. And, uh, and, and like I say, that's, that's all very good. It's not just the, ca the capital gains provisions. There are some other provisions of the law that further help to level the Bitcoin US dollar playing field. And I, I do want to uh, 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 insist that I favor those aspects of this mm -hmm. law. I think they are a gain all around. Mm -hmm. And it seems that the crypto community is super excited about this. I was at the Miami conference where this was announced and you had yeah, just the uproar as soon as he announced it, everyone's standing and you have the president there on the screen talking to us and saying, you know, we've seen the debasement of money supply in the US. So we're not getting any of the perks of the US government just printing out a bunch of money. All it's doing is hurting. And um, sometimes that uh, that effect of inflation is lost when you can see, you know, some perhaps some ostensible effects of like some bonuses of inflation. You say, oh, well, we all get like $1,000 given to us. Great, isn't that great? It's helping poor people. But you don't actually see the the uh, long-term effects of that in that it's just actually debasing everyone's money. And in El Salvador, you know, they weren't given $1,000 each or however much the government's sending out. All they're seeing is the value in their savings account going down. So like the, the atmosphere was incredible and exciting and all of this, we knew that it wasn't, um, a given that it had to be passed and we hadn't seen the law. We hadn't actually seen the specific right. wording. Now today that law was passed and we got a look at what was actually passed. So let's dive into that and talk about the caveats there. So mm -hmm. what, are your, what are your main contentions with this bill? Well, when people were anticipating uh, the bill, Naomi, uh, uh, they were calling it legal tender legislation. They were saying, are they gonna make Bitcoin legal tender? In fact, most of the uh, most of the provisions of the bill aren't, aren't strictly legal tender provisions. There are two that are, and those are articles seven and 13. The, uh, uh, and uh, what they do is what all legal tender laws do. They, they compel acceptance of whatever's designated as legal tender in some fashion. Mm -hmm. And uh, first of all, I should say, I'm against all legal tender laws. There, it's not necessary for anything to be legal tender for most purposes. That doesn't mean that the government can't specify how it wants its taxes paid and, and uh, dues and what have you. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, legal tender laws, though, usually go beyond that uh, in compelling people to accept uh, specific types of currency for certain payments. Now, usually, the only payments they have to the only payments they have to accept the legal tender in are uh, outstanding debts, debts mm -hmm. that have been outstanding before the law was passed. And that's what section, uh, or rather Article 13 does. It says, Bitcoin's a legal tender for any debts outstanding as this law goes into effect. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, that's usually okay as long as the uh, exchange people have, in, as long as uh, in making these contracts, right, uh, people specified U.S. dollars. Now they'll be paid in bitcoins, but presumably at the dollar equivalent. Sometimes <laughs> governments abuse legal tender laws to uh, allow you to pay, for example, with a depreciated fiat money, a debt contracted in gold, so that the debtor ends up getting screwed, if you don't mind my using the... Uh, Let's call it as it is. They are getting yeah. screwed. And we know that legal tender laws can do that, but that's uh, not the case here. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, the law is desirable. It's unnecessary. At worst, it doesn't do any good, and it could conceivably do harm, and I'm against it for both reasons. Now, S Article 7 is a different story. It's also a legal tender provision, but it's unusual. It's a rare provision that go most governments don't have it at all, uh, including uh, 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 governments that have the other sort of legal tender law. And that provides that merchants are required, not, not allowed, required to accept Bitcoin in payments. Now, the provision doesn't say much more than that, but if it's to have any meaning at all, that must mean that they have to accept Bitcoin at a, a, a rate of exchange uh, dollar, the current dollar rate of exchange as equivalent to dollars. They can't say, no, I want dollars. Mm -hmm. Now, it's true. We, we know that technically the means exist for merchants to uh, seamlessly convert those Bitcoins into uh, dollars so that they don't ever have to hold Bitcoin, they don't have to bear any risk, et cetera, et cetera. But again, that means that at best, this provision is otios, that is, doesn't serve any purpose. At worst, it compels people to do something they don't want to do, which is deal in a currency they'd rather not deal in. And I think that that is a bad thing. And, uh, and uh, a law, some people have said, well, since it doesn't matter, you know, that's really the same thing as giving people choice. No, it's not. It's not. It may be that the costs of abiding by the law are trivial. It's still an obnoxious law. At best, it could become something worse in the future. So I think that those of us who believe in free choice and currency and freedom of contract and all that uh, should condemn those aspects of the law, not the whole thing, but those two articles. Yeah, so let's break that down a little bit. So um, you've said that overview, you know, great, awesome, legal tender giving people more options. And then uh, 17, I mean, 13 goes against like existing contracts where people have said, well, I agree to this and this is how much I owe and it's in US dollars and now, you know, they can be paid back in Bitcoin. And so it kind of goes against the freedom of allowing people the contracts to decide what currencies they want to accept. Um, and then seven is the compulsion aspect where merchants can't refuse it. Now, this is a little bit different to other places because I'm sure lots of people are thinking, well, in the US, we, we have legal tender laws. We People have to pay in US dollar. They have to accept it. But talk to me about the big difference between um, you know, spot trades and paying debts, yeah. because they're two different things that I don't think people Very understand. Thing. In the US, so, so a spot exchange is just what it sounds like. It's money on the barrel head for a current exchange. It's not that you owe somebody something for you contracted for a while back and now mm -hmm. it's time to pay. So that's the basic difference. But uh, in fact, as I said earlier, most countries, even those that do have legal tender laws, and they don't all have them in, in a meaningful way, uh, uh, don't apply the legal tender statutes to spot transactions, only mm -hmm. to outstanding debts. In the United States, for example, uh, Federal Reserve notes are legal tender and coins are legal tender up to certain amounts. So nobody's compelled to except a bunch of pennies mm -hmm. for $500 transaction. However, um, merchants are free 
to refuse either. In fact, mm -hmm. we just went through a period when m many merchants didn't deal in cash at all. They didn't have to change the law for that. The legal tender uh, status of, of notes and coins never made it compulsory for merchants to deal in cash if they didn't want to. And in fact, they don't have to accept dollars at all. You can start a business in the United States and say, I want to be paid in something other than U.S. dollars. And it's been done. Mm -hmm. I was just reading about a firm that was a gaming firm that was in business. I can't find them anymore. I think they failed. <laughs> I'm not surprised because their <laughs> business model was we're only going to let people pay in Bitcoin. And that was legal. That was legal because we don't have legal tender laws that apply to spot exchanges. Uh, it didn't work, but it was legal. And that's important. Some countries have no legal tender laws to speak mm -hmm. of. In Scotland, for example, one of my favorite uh, countries when it comes to talking about money because of their wonderful history of free banking and some time ago now, uh, neither Bank of England notes nor Scottish bank notes, the Scottish commercial banks, some of them still issue notes, are legal tender. There's no legal tender paper, paper money in Scotland. Mm -hmm. The coins issued by the Royal Mint are legal tender, but only up to minor amounts. So most of the time when people are buying stuff in Scotland, they're not using any legal tender and no merchants are obliged to accept anything. So, yeah. so this legal tender thing, for those of us who believe in monetary freedom, legal tender is at best a fifth wheel and at worst a way of compelling people to engage in exchanges uh, 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 or bargains or contracts that they don't want to exchange, engage in. Mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, that's a good reason to condemn any such legislation. Yeah, and let's uh, let's break that down even further. So, um, you know, at the moment, as we said, in the U.S., if I walk into a store, they might have a sign that says card only, or they might have a sign that says cash only. Absolutely. And uh, and I can, you know, they can choose whether or not to accept my business based on what I want to pay. Um, it seems that in El Salvador, every merchant is going to be compelled to accept Bitcoin. It's not that a merchant is allowed to turn someone away and say, no, I only accept, you know, uh, US dollars or I only accept anything else. Uh, they have to accept the Bitcoin. Now, let's talk about the barriers to entry here, because I've been in the crypto world for a long, long time, and it can still be really, really confusing. And especially for people where you have an economy where 70% of the people are unbanked, they're using cash every day. You know, they're not even using apps on their phone for, uh, you know, to link their bank account and pay for things. Um, and so this is, I mean, th th there's a big barrier to entry for, for these people if suddenly you're saying, well, now you have to install this electronic pay payment method. You have to understand how to accept crypto payments. You have to understand the Lightning Network because it's all going to be based on that, apparently. And meanwhile, these are people who might just be selling coconuts at the side of the street. They might be selling mangoes, you know? It seems like there, I mean, it, this compulsion element actually could hurt a lot of people. So uh, we should be careful. The law does provide, the, the Salvadoran law, does exempt those people who are not equipped to accept Bitcoin from it, having to accept it. So if you're selling mangoes or coconuts and you don't have access to the internet or you don't have the necessary you know, devices, uh, you're not required to abide by the law for now. But Section 12 of the law says that the government's going to be taking active steps to make sure everyone can, in fact, use bit, transact in Bitcoin, whether that means providing people with wallets, fixing up the Internet, making that work everywhere and so on. Um, and of course, that means that uh, at first, many the law doesn't have any teeth for many Salvadorans. And, and, mm -hmm. and again, that's a case where that's not that doesn't make the, 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 the law good. It just means that it's otios, right? It doesn't do any harm, but that's not a good enough excuse. It's not a good excuse for a potentially coercive law to say, oh, well, most people don't have to abide by it now. Mm -hmm. But once the government does what it says it's going to do in Article 12, then in fact, uh, everybody will have to use Bitcoin. Uh, and that seems to be its ultimate goal. Again, I'm not saying that the government shouldn't encourage the use of Bitcoin. I think it's great for them. I think they should get their internet working for everybody. I think they should. Uh, I think it would be fine for them to supply wallets or whatever else they have to do to enable people to deal in Bitcoin, everybody. I think that part is the positive part is good. 
when they say once you have the internet, once you have the necessary hardware, then you cannot refuse to deal in Bitcoin. That's where I say they have crossed the line uh, that uh, no nobody who believes in free choice and currency should want any mm -hmm. government to cross. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and that is that is the problem. And I've heard a lot of people on the web this morning, you know, on Twitter, coming up with all kinds of, I mean, people who I suspect are libertarian, coming up with all kinds of excuses saying, well, it's not going to matter. Well, you know, a lot of people exe are exempt. Well, the U.S. dollar is already legal tender in El Salvador. I've heard all kinds of things. And I'm a little impatient about it. All I really want to hear people say is El Salvador should repeal Article 7 and 13 of the law and leave the rest, which is separating the wheat from the chaff. That's mm -hmm. what I want to hear people say. And enough of this apologizing. We aren't talking about a totally benign government, by the way. So, you know, uh, I do think that uh, people hate slippery slope arguments for good reason. But I think that uh, here, this is uh, there's a bit of a Mephistophelian deal going on, a Faustian bargain. I mean, and and uh, I don't think that that that's a bargain that yeah. uh, is something we should celebrate. I think that's such a great point. And that seems to be this culture that's emerged, emerged in Bitcoin over the last few years where people will just shut down any criticism at all. And, I, you know, it, it kind Don't of shocks me because I, I always thought that this was a community that strove to, um, you know, innovate and we, we're on the cutting edge. And any time that there is something that could be improved, yes, let's talk about it. Let's figure out how to improve it. But instead, you know, conversations are shut down. And in this respect, I, I agree. I've seen the same thing. People over and over apologizing for the weaknesses in this bill, saying like, well, don't make, you know, perfection the enemy of the good. And it's like, well, it's not yeah. about that. It's about it's the about fight that. for freedom. And it's, it's about, about making that. this the best thing that it could be. It could yeah. be so much better. And the crypto community should be pushing to have those sections you mentioned repealed. Exactly. Nobody is saying, let's toss this whole legislation because part of it is no good. Mm -hmm. That would perhaps be letting the, the best be the enemy of the good. But right. I've never said that. I have said we should condemn those two articles and, and to the extent possible, try to persuade the Salvadoran government to amend the law so mm -hmm. that those articles are repealed and the good stuff is kept. That's yeah. what people can do. Now, you can't call that letting the best be the enemy of the good. Right. Uh, and it's, it's easy. All you have to do is is tweet the right thing. <laughs> Get out there and tweet it and tell yeah. if you're talking to Bukele, well, tell him that while you're at it. You know, don't yeah. just uh, shake his hand and say, great, we're done. Say, yeah. by the way, you know, um, this isn't quite what we had in mind. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I think maybe a lot of people are maybe scared of losing access. Maybe they have his ear and they like the power that that gives them. I mean, that's kind of reprehensible if you're someone who's fighting for freedom and you're just kind of letting that side slide, stuff slide. Um, this can be made better. And let's talk about, uh, you know, the ethos of freedom in the Bitcoin community. Because, I mean, I fell in love with Bitcoin because it was an alternative. It was an alternative that I could freely choose. Uh, you have government mandating US dollars and you kind of have this monopoly on the financial system and suddenly you had this money that the government couldn't shut down and people were free to choose to use it if they wanted. And that choice was everything. That choice was everything. It wasn't that we had a competing government come in and say, well, we're mandating this other fiat currency and um, you could choose between the two. No, it was completely outside of that. And uh, there was no mandate and there was no locking you into any system. Um, so, I mean, that's really what Bitcoin was built on. And so this law really doesn't uphold that freedom if it's being mandated and people have to accept Bitcoin. Like the same way that I wouldn't Those two articles, it. those yeah. two articles of the law. The rest of the law is good. Yeah, yeah, for sure. The two articles. And, you know, it's the same way, like, it, like I love Bitcoin. I love it. You know, I you can see I got like, my God, this room is just like a Bitcoin shrine. You know, um, I love the idea of competing currencies people can freely choose to use. But if suddenly the government said, oh, let's we're going to mandate Bitcoin in every country, 
you know, I definitely wouldn't be <laughs> before that. I'd, I'd like Bitcoin itself, but I definitely would be against the mandate. And I think people need to learn to have nuance in their ideas to separate those two things. Like one is freedom of choice, the other is coercion. Absolutely. And, and you made a, a, a good point that sometimes I think uh, people, some people in the Bitcoin community are, are uh, uh, as I said in one of my tweets, they're losing the plot to the freedom plot. Uh, and perhaps losing it because they're thinking this is going to boost demand for Bitcoin, this is going to raise the price, or this is going to encourage mm -hmm. other governments to adopt it, and so on. Uh, and some are, I suspect, thinking this is going to mean more business for my app. Right. <clears throat> and, uh, and all of those things should be secondary to uh, making sure that uh, whatever else Bitcoin achieves, it's achieving greater freedom of choice. And, uh, and, and we should always regret anything that, uh, that promotes Bitcoin at the expense of that freedom. I don't think any uh, true blue uh, Bitcoin uh, proponent who's been at it for a long time, starting when it was uh, just a, a, a way of advancing liberty, Mm -hmm. would ever want to see anyone forced to to have anything to do with Bitcoin who doesn't want to have something to do with it. Yeah, I agree. One other thing that I saw people mentioning in your thread was the $150 million fund. So the idea is that merchants, you know, they're compelled to accept Bitcoin, but if they don't want to hold it, then they can transfer it. And the government has this fund where they're going to be buying back uh, some of this Bitcoin. It'll go in their fund and they can receive, the merchant can receive US dollars in exchange. Talk to me about why that's problematic. Well, <laughs> I haven't, you know, I haven't insisted that that particular article is bad, but <laughs> I don't much like it. We now have a, a, an open world market for Bitcoin. There's no reason why anyone who has Bitcoin and wants to dispose of it can't do so in that market. What do we need a fund for in El Salvador? What is, what is the point of that? I don't like it. I think it's uh, another example of a fifth wheel. I guess I should call it a sixth wheel. And, and we got a uh, lot of wheels here, George. Too many wheels. The 71st wheel. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, surely, uh, as people have emphasized uh, on, on Twitter in connection with this discussion, it's very easy for any merchant to not have to hold Bitcoin at all. And that's true without any fund being uh, available for the purpose of, of uh, purchasing Bitcoin. Uh, now, uh, what, I, what I understand uh, is happening with some is that uh, there, there may be uh, an attempt to, to garner some monopoly rents by making that the place where uh, people uh, setting things up so that the exchanges go on uh, through that fund. I don't know enough yet, and we'll have to keep an eye out on it. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's a, a, another example of, some, of something that is at best redundant, and at worst, uh, potentially uh, 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 a bad thing. But I, mm -hmm. I don't want to go too far out on a limb based on what I know about that arrangement. Yeah, I will add to that that it does come back to the principle of the thing as well, because sure, you're not being forced to hold the Bitcoin, but you are being forced to accept it, yes. um, which to me, it really does go against the ethos of Bitcoin. So I too would like those articles that specify that to be removed. Um, but it's, I mean, it's interesting. I can potentially see a use case for that. Like if you, if you have are accepting Bitcoin, you're like, okay, this is mandated, so then I can just sell it off to the government. But then to sell it off to the government, you have to pay transaction fees. Otherwise, you're mandated to use Lightning, and they've got these custodial wallets that they're, you know, um, popularizing there. So then it becomes this custodial service, which again goes away from the ethos of what I think Bitcoin is about. Yeah, there's some rent seeking going on here, to use the yeah. technical term. And uh, that too is something that uh, our community should be wary of. Mm -hmm. Explain rent seeking for anyone who's uh, watching this kind of corruption of government and private sector. Yeah, I mean, very briefly, it means uh, setting up uh, laws and such so that somebody gets rich <laughs> uh, uh, 
who wouldn't if people were all making all their choices voluntarily. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it does seem that there are a lot of people who stand to gain tremendously for this. I mean, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't gain. Like, people should always gain if they're providing value. But when it comes to, like, a government mandate creating that value, that's quite different from the open mm -hmm. market deciding to give people business. That's right. um, so, I mean, like, Bitcoin, I mean... I, I do want to touch on this briefly, this idea of Lightning in El Salvador, because everyone is saying, well, Lightning is the solution, Lightning is the solution. And um, the reason why they're using Lightning is because Bitcoin transaction fees are really, really high. And the people of, Sal yeah. of uh, El Salvador just, you know, it doesn't make any sense um, for them to be paying such transaction fees. It's such a large amount of their savings that it, it hurts them. Um, you know, and then so Bitcoin becomes problematic when you have small UTXOs. Let's say you buy something for two dollars. Why would anyone accept that? Because, well, first of all, why would you spend it? It's going to cost you a lot more to spend that uh, than, uh, than your coffee or whatever you're buying for two dollars but on the other side of things if someone's mandated to accept that and they've just received two dollars but it's going to cost them twenty dollars to move it like in the past few months i mean we've seen transaction fees rise as high as sixty dollars you know it's been as low as eight dollars um uh, to get something in the the blockchain uh, you know quickly and so it it does become problematic when you're mandating something that in you know pushes such a big cost on these people but then they're saying well lightning is is the solution of this have you kind of dived into the um, implications of lightning like I mean my understanding is that you set up your own channel I mean you still have to have like hundreds of transactions to justify a $20 fee in order to open that channel um, otherwise you're kind of depending on someone else to open it for you you're trusting them it's custodial so it's kind of seems like a big trade-off there well uh, I think for Bitcoin purists, of course, uh, Lightning is not not uh, the cat's meow. Uh, but everything, as far as compulsion is concerned, everything goes back to how the Salvadoran government is going to, uh, how it understands this idea that you don't have to accept Bitcoin unless you're equipped. Now, being equipped to accept it could include being able to use Lightning, right? Mm. Uh, so that, that you're not forcing people to bear the very high... Uh, uh, costs involved of dealing with right. base, base base layer Bitcoin, and so and I, I suspect that that's that that is indeed the case. They're not going to force people to sell a mango uh, and uh, accept uh, <laughs> Bitcoin uh, and bear the costs of uh, of, uh, of of do, of doing that without relying on Lightning or something else. So I I I think it's not quite <laughs> as bad as making everybody use. Bitcoin for small transfers, that is the, you know, uh, uh, on chain. But, um, but I, uh, I, I, I do think that, again, that the question isn't so much whether people will have big costs imposed uh, upon them, but simply whether the, they have a choice or mm -hmm. are being compelled to do something that the law shouldn't compel them to do. I should say, since we're talking about lightning and all that, a lot of the discussion about what's happening in El Salvador has in included discussion of the importance of remittances. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, and of course, remittances are, are very important. And uh, they make up something like 20, over 20 percent of uh, the income of El Salvador. Right. But nobody here is arguing, I'm certainly not arguing that anything should be done to make remittances any more difficult than necessary. And I think the use of Bitcoin and also of Strike, uh, whether with Bitcoin or otherwise, uh, as a technology that allow, uh, as technologies that allow remittances to be made with lower cost, I think those are wonderful developments. Mm -hmm. I think they're fantastic. They should be encouraged in every way. However, Articles 7 and 13 have nothing to do with it nothing to do with it there's yeah. nothing there's there's no need for either of those laws to allow people to remit money to el salvador from across its borders cheaply mm -hmm. so I let's not confuse these things right exactly i have a couple of clarifying questions perhaps you might know the answer to them or perhaps it's still undecided um how are they treating other cryptocurrencies are all of the same capital gains that corporations businesses have to pay do they still apply to other cryptos or and is it just bitcoin that is uh specified just bitcoin hmm. it's just bitcoin 
Uh, the law, by the way, just says Bitcoin. It doesn't say BTC. <laughs> it yeah. doesn't say <laughs> what Bitcoin, but I, everybody assumes that that's it's the, right. the old original whatever. Well, if you say original mm -hmm. in this with the, with this crowd now, I'm going to get in trouble. Uh, everyone is going to everyone. Well, yeah, everybody. Go to George's Ours is the, whatever. I think they mean BTC yeah. in the legislation. I think we can take that for granted. No, as far as I'm aware, uh, certainly this law does not change the capital gains tax mm -hmm. status of transactions that involve other kinds of mm -hmm. cryptocurrency. They will still be subject, as far as this law is concerned, to the the uh, capital gains tax that has that applies to other capital gains. Mm -hmm. And so the other question was about discounts. How much does this law? Um, uh, allow for people to set incentives for paying in a certain um, uh, currency. So if they want to say, well, I don't really want to accept Bitcoin, it's going to be a nightmare in terms of accounting or whatever, you know, um, I will give you a, a discount if you pay in yeah. cash. I, I, I can't, uh, it, it makes no sense to have uh, those uh, provisions, Section 7 and uh, Article 7 in particular, and then say people can charge a different price for Bitcoin. Makes right. no sense. Again, this is another instance where if people have said to me on Twitter today, oh, well, if somebody doesn't want to accept Bitcoin, a merchant who has the means for accepting it and so would be subject to the uh, rule, all the merchant has to do is charge a, a, a different a price, a, a premium for payment in Bitcoin. So you're selling a bottle of wine, it's $20 or it's, oh goodness, I have to divide now and I don't know the price. Anyway, the equivalent of $25 or $30 in Bitcoin, let's make it a big number, $30 in Bitcoin. And who's going to pay with Bitcoin then, right? No. That, I mean, if it were that easy to evade the law, it would be a joke. It would yeah. make no sense. Now, it could be that they just decided they were going to be funny and put this provision in there and, you know, and they didn't mean it. But what they almost certainly mean is that you have to accept, the merchant has to accept Bitcoin at the prevailing US dollar equivalent rate, right? Mm -hmm. So if, the, if it's either $20 or it's $20 worth of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I think that's what the law has to mean. But if it didn't mean that, it would be contemptible just because it's stupid and that we should still be arguing for repealing it. It doesn't do it, we repeal it, okay? I mean, who needs laws? that don't do anything. So we don't need laws that don't do anything, right? And we don't need laws that compel people to do things they don't want to do. Between those two facts, we have all the arguments we need, no matter what all these thousands of silly defenses that have been put forward for Article 7 and 13, between those two facts, we have all the arguments we need for repeal. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't have to make any more arguments and we shouldn't have to listen to any more excuses. Mm -hmm. So I also have, uh, oh, I just got a, a super chat from Chats with Decentralized who said, thank you for doing this. Wow, thank you so much for your super chat. I really appreciate that. Um, I also accept crypto for super chats. If you go to Cointree uh, uh, slash Naomi Brockwell, I'll add that link but in the you, description. But, but um, you don't have to. You don't have to. You don't have to. I'm not going to coerce you because that's the uh, difference between me. You don't have to accept me. Okay. Uh, and the El, El Salvador government is, you know, I'm not going to force you to pay in, uh, in crypto. Uh, but I'll put I'll just put that in the chat there. Um, but thank you, huge thank you to you. Um, so, oh, now I've completely, you you just, you wiped my memory now. It's all gone. Um, I was gonna say, what were you just talking about, George? You just mentioned the... Um... Something really clever, I think. It was really pithy and yeah. intelligent. <laughs> uh, yeah, I remember that part of it too. Um, <laughs> It was something to do with, you know, my mind's gone completely blank on that. Oh, yeah, no, no. OK, so it's on the potential upside of this. So before we saw the actual wording of this, some people were speculating about how it could be this Trojan horse in a good way for crypto with before we knew that it was uh, coerced when we thought it was just going to be either, you know, that's their legal tender or, you know, that's their um, the, a, an alternative that they give to the people. People like Caitlin Long were saying that, well, this would actually be a game changer for how 
Bitcoin is treated in other countries. Like mm. let's for example, say for example, the US, you know, it's treated as property there, but I believe there are certain laws, um, international laws that dictate how countries must treat each other's sovereign currency. So would this affect the status of Bitcoin in other countries if they'd gone a different route? I don't think so. You don't think so? I don't think so. Now, I'm, I'm not an expert in the laws in question, mm -hmm. but I don't think that uh, El, El Salvador is making Bitcoin a uh, legal tender, turns it into sovereign money. Interesting. OK. I think um, it's, still a, 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 it's still a money that uh, comes from uh, the private marketplace and mm -hmm. not from any sovereign nation. Yeah, but I may uh, be wrong. I may be wrong. Uh, you know, this, but uh, I have my doubts about about that. Yeah, for sure. Because that was really exciting for a moment. I was all like drinking the Kool Aid, like this is going to be awesome. This is what we need. I thought of it as similar to the um, the Special Purpose Depository Institute in Wyoming, where you know suddenly you're recognized as a state chartered bank. You get a Federal Reserve you know account. All of this. I was like, oh, this is a Trojan horse to get around the Bit License. This might yeah. be a Trojan horse to get around like you know yeah. the, uh, treating it as property or whatever. But I was wrong. Um, and I don't think, uh, yeah, I wouldn't yeah. hold my breath on that one. And, uh, and El Salvador is not exactly uh, a government that uh, the U.S. government in particular, but plenty of others as well, is going to treat as, uh, as a, uh, uh, an exemplar, a kind mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, setting a precedent for other countries. I think that uh, that's, uh, that's a bit of a stretch. Yeah, for sure. So let's go ahead and kind of summarize uh what's uh what's going on here oh it looks like okay i did get some coin trees as well thank you to all the anonymous people um who uh sent coin trees on, on my coin tree i really appreciate uh that so in summary george overview of this exciting you know really great el salvador is jumping on the bitcoin bandwagon people have another choice in what they can use um freedom, all of that stuff. It's its really exciting news and could help people because of the terrible um, in debasement of the money supply that the US is doing right now, the trillions of dollars that they're just printing. I mean, we can expect hyperinflation in our, our future. Like, what, what are your thoughts on that? And then we'll, no, we'll I don't summarize think so. that. I, mean, I don't think hyperinflation is coming. Uh, 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 we've been crying wolf about that one for far too long. Uh, well, let me push back against that. I think <laughs> okay. some people have said that, you know, perhaps in the past, because the predominance of the US dollar has kept yeah. its position. I mean, that predominance is going down. I think it's down to below 60% now as like a, 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 a currency, a reserve currency. And so as that gets lower and people stop using it, we're not going to have that peg to kind of prop it up. No, but the uh, re demand for dollars as a reserve currency is not the same as the extent to which the dollar is actually used in international transacting. Those aren't mm -hmm. the same. It's the same uh, to think otherwise is to commit the same fallacy that has many Bitcoin fans assuming that as the cap market cap of Bitcoin goes up, that means more people are using it as money. It's not mm -hmm. so. So uh, no, the dollar is going to be here for a good long time. It's, it's, I, should, it's, I need to get you and Gene Epstein on a show together. He yeah. predicts in the next 10 years we're going to have some runaway inflation. So maybe you two can um, can have a chat about that. That'd be very fun. Sure, that'd be fun. Uh, I'd like to have another excuse to come on. Sure. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I mean, OK, so just judging from what we've seen in like the past few months, you know, we had the consumer price index came out. It had inflation at like what 4.2 percent. They were expecting 3.6 or numbers thereabouts. So yeah. we're already overshooting what they were aiming for. And that's, you know, haven't is, hasn't even taken into account that the velocity of money is way down right now. We've done all of this money printing, but that money hasn't, you know, made its way through the economy yet. So you're, you're still not predicting that that's going to cause any major hiccups in terms of inflation? Not right away. Uh, none right away. of the stuff that's been going on, none of the numbers actually suggest that the Fed is overshooting yet. And uh, there are a number of reasons why even though they didn't anticipate 4.2% annualized inflation back, I think it was in April when those mm -hmm. numbers came up, uh, even though it was more than anticipated, it still uh, left the Fed uh, below target. The, the big questions are going forward. Uh, and I am concerned. I want to give the people the impression I'm not concerned about excessively high inflation, not mm -hmm. hyper, but 
higher than it should be or higher than the Fed claims it's aiming for. Um, there's, there's, there, because of the Fed's having anticipated not having to raise interest rates, which is what it has to do to put a lid on inflation when mm-hmm. it starts to uh, exceed target or approach target, because the Fed announced last year several times that it didn't anticipate it would have to do that till 2023, 2024. I worry that now they're going to be timid about raising rates when they probably should to to actually keep their promise. Well, I'm worried about that. I'm worried about that. One other thing. Well, before we move on, haven't they backed themselves into a corner at this stage? If the economy does heat up, how can they raise rates when we've passed the tipping point of GDP to debt? You know, they're just going to be paying so much money on uh, in interest on the debt that they're paying off. It seems and it's going to way overshoot GDP. Well, now you're anticipating my second point, <laughs> is that in the longer run, I'm concerned about the fact that the, 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 the federal debt is expected to grow to very high levels. Mm. And indeed, the interest burden on that debt will be uh, 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 so high that it will pose a lot of challenges. And, uh, and uh, particularly if the Fed uh, responds by raising interest rates to keep a mm-hmm. lid on inflation. So there's going to be a lot of pressure on the Fed, and uh, there's a risk of long-run fiscal dominance of monetary policy, which is a fancy way of saying that because uh, the debt burden is so great and the interest burden is so great, pressure is placed on uh, the the monetary authorities to uh, allow some inflation to erode the debt, and uh, and uh, and they yield to it. That's not some a possibility we can entirely rule out by any means under these exceptional circumstances. So I am concerned about the, the future uh, risk of inflation. Uh, I think calling it hyperinflation is perhaps uh, not helping because if you, if you uh, overstate the risk, and particularly mm-hmm. if you claim that hyperinflation is right around the corner, as many people have been doing, uh, based, I think, on falsely uh, extrapolating from uh, short-run monetary statistics, then then uh, what happens is you discredit the whole idea that inflation is something we should worry about. I think it's better to proceed cautiously and to recognize the risks without overstating okay. them, yeah. because in the end, uh, what happens is people just ignore you, like they ignored the boy who cried wolf. And we know that the wolf eventually showed up. <laughs> so <laughs> right. so uh, we don't want to be the boy who cried wolf. We want to be uh, uh, adults who say, hey, you know, um, there's something here we ought to be concerned about. Then people might listen and then maybe we won't have to, we won't have the wolf devour us. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, current inflation is probably not doing the best for El Salvador uh, right now by the, for the people there, you know, even losing 4% of their value, like having prices increase that much, it is, uh, is going to hurt them tremendously. Um, so I understand why they became a dollarized nation, um, but now it seems that the dollar perhaps is, yeah, it's, <laughs> perhaps there are better alternatives out there. And so they're looking to Bitcoin. The major contentions you have, just to summarize there, these two articles in the bill, like overall bill is great, but the two articles are either unnecessary and should be repealed or they're damaging because they're coercive and go against the ethos of Bitcoin, which is an ethos of freedom. And so the Bitcoin community should maybe stop apologizing for this bill in its totality and start pushing back on specifics and asking for the repeal of these two articles, which are Article 7 and Article 13. Yes, I think that's fair enough. I think, I mean, I actually think it's okay for people to celebrate the bill if they say, by the way, we think it's good, but these two articles are not Mm -hmm. good and and they should be repealed. That uh, that would be okay with me. I mean, I I don't want to suggest that uh, the bill as a whole ought to be condemned. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a matter of a glass half empty or half full. If people want to right. see it as half full, that's OK. That's reasonable. Mm-hmm. But, uh, they should point out uh, the empty part <laughs> and <laughs> say uh, we need to fill that, too.
Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think that your perspective is very much needed in a space where either people don't like the criticism, they don't want to think about it, maybe they're worried that it'll affect their bags. Uh, you know, no criticism against the money I'm holding a lot of. It's so important for a community that believes in freedom to be consistent in ideology, um, to apply, you know, consistently apply their logic to all areas. When you have a bill like this, sure, glass half full, let's celebrate the half full and let's push to get it better. We can get more freedom. We can help the Salvadorian people even more. And I think that we owe it to people to not apologize for things that are not good enough and pretend that they are and pretend that, you know, this is everything we could have hoped for. Let's work to make it better. Absolutely. I'm going to give you the last word, Naomi, because I, <laughs> I can't say that better. Well, thank you so much, George. This has been so wonderful having you on. Uh, everyone should read George's book, Good Money. It's on the shelf, right? there um it's just such a wonderful resource you always provide such a, a fantastic perspective uh in the bitcoin community in monetary policy in economics and it's uh very much appreciated so thank you for your time and oh thank you to uh Aton. uh thank you so much i just got a super chat in there i really appreciate that Aton. and uh hello i hope uh, San Fran is going well. Um, but yeah, thank you, George. And to everyone for tuning in. Thank you so much. Don't forget to hit the like button and the subscribe button before you go. That will be appreciated too. And I will see you all next time. Thank you, Naomi. See ya.